My dear brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus, I welcome you to the 33rd class of our in-depth Bible study series and we continue our study on the three worlds and today we see the part four. So in our last class we saw how God, after saving Noah, he left the world at large to follow their own course because as they were not glorifying him even though they knew him God led them to their own lusts so that they continued in their own path and was deceived by the devil but then when this happened God selected just one man that is the tenth generation from Noah Noah was tenth from Adam and from Noah it was the tenth generation a man called Abraham and we saw how God called him out of his own country where he lived and out of the condition in which he was, he too was worshipping idols. Then God appeared to him and he said, I am the Almighty God, you leave everybody and come to a place I will show you, I will make your name great and I will bless you exceedingly and I will make nations to come out of you and all that. And then uh, how we saw that happen in chapter 12 and then again in 15th chapter God renewed his uh, promise and then made a covenant with him and then again in 17th and 18th chapters we see God uh, renewed that same promise and finally in chapter 22 we saw how God wanted to test him and he tested him by asking him to give up his only son Isaac was born 25 years after God promised him and then when Abraham was willing to do even that God made a very big promise to him and God was so pleased that he made a promise which is very significant and based upon that promise only God has been dealing with Abraham and his nations in the second world so in chapter 22 we read what God told him and particularly verses 17 and 18. That in blessing I will bless thee and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of heaven and as the sand which is upon the seashore. And thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies and in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because thou hast obeyed my voice. So in these two verses, God repeatedly speaks about one thing, that is the seed. See, that is what is the main object of these two promises we see here, that in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of heaven and sand of the seashore, and thy seed shall possess the gates of the enemies. Again, thy seed, it's about the seed. And then in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. So the main focus is on the seed. In thy seed, all the nations will be blessed. Thy seed will possess the gates of the enemies. Thy seed will be like the stars of the sky and the sand of the seashore. So who is this seed? We want to know more about that. So, as we read about this, we come upon a statement by Apostle Paul in Galatians chapter 3 verse 16 and we need to look into deeply that scripture now. Galatians chapter 3 verse 16. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made, he saith not unto seeds as of many, but as of one and to thy seed which is Christ. So here Paul is saying the promises were made and he saith not to seeds as of many, not in the plural, but as of one and to thy seed, that is singularly to one seed which is Christ Jesus. So he's saying all the promises was unto only one seed, not unto seeds like as many, but unto thy seed and that seed is Christ he says. Now we see a dilemma here because when we go back and see the promise 
made to Abraham in Genesis 17, 20 to 17 and 18. We see God is saying that in blessing I will bless thee and multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of heaven. Stars means they are not single. There's so many uncountable actually. And also as the sand of the seashore. This is what God essentially told Abraham in chapter 15 also. You see God calls him out and asks him to look at the stars and then he says like this. 15.5 And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now towards heaven and tell the stars if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. So here it is the numbers of the stars that he clearly refers to. It is not just one seed. It is numerous like the stars. Now we see a paradoxical statement here. Because talking about the seed, we hear that Abraham's seed inherited that land as God had promised in 12, uh, 7, God had promised him. You see, and the Lord appeared unto Abraham and said, unto thy seed will I give this land and so on. So I will give this land means that's what happened later on. After 400 years uh, uh, through Joshua, they were able to enter into the land and uh, drive out all the other people and they possessed the land. And there they began to grow, grow, grow. And literally what God said here was fulfilled. That we see in one statement in Hosea chapter 1, verse 10. Uh, Hosea 1, 10. Yet the number of children of Israel shall be as the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured nor numbered. So there you see. It says the number of Israel, you see, of children of Israel were as the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured or numbered. So that was literally fulfilled with the seed of Abraham. There were so many. So, but what does it mean when Paul says, it was not unto seeds as of many, but of seed as unto one, and that seed is Christ Jesus. Now that we can understand, of course, uh, we all know that some words have been used only in a singular sense, but it also applies in a plural sense. Like some words in English language, that is used for singular as well as plural numbers. And one ex example is the word sheep. Now sheep or deer or reindeer as we are in Christmas season or bison. So these words, it remains the same whether it is one or too many. When we talk about sheep, there is a sheep there. So one sheep also is sheep and there are hundreds of sheep so it is the same. It does not change. We don't say sheeps like as other animals like cat or horses. For cat we say one means cat, two means cats we say. Cat or cats like horse or horses or goose or geese. Like that singular and plural is there. But some words it is the same. Now talking about seed here in our study. That word seed occurs hundreds of times in the Bible, in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. But very interestingly, most of the places it is used as a singular only, a seed only. Only in one place in the entire Old Testament, the word seeds is used, and that is in Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 9. 20 to 9. Thou shalt not sow thy vineyard with diverse seeds. So you say, you shall not sow with diverse seeds. So there the plural word is used. And in the New Testament, other than the place where which we already read in Galatians 3.16, only one instance it is used. And that is in Matthew 13.4. And 13.32 and Mark 4.31, this is all about the same inc incident, I mean, repeated. I uh, will read from Mark 4.31. It is like a grain of mustard seed, 
which when it is sown in the earth is less than all the seeds of the earth. So the word seeds is used. And in Matthew chapter 13 verse 4 and verse 32 also we read. And when he sowed, some seeds fell by the wayside. So some seeds is used, but then that is in italics. So that is not in the original. And what about in 32? Which indeed is the least of all seeds. So this is one place. So he says it is the least of all seeds. So there that word yes is added to seed, means meaning plural. Other than that, hundreds of places the word seed is used, particularly in terms of people or hairs. I'm talking about hairs, like that's what God meant to Abraham. It's not the literal seed that we sow, but the seed of man, that means offsprings. In some modern translations, the word seed is altogether avoided. The word descendants is used. And there also, it is sometimes plural and all that. It is up to the translators. But when Paul says it is not unto seeds, but unto seed, in particularly he is pointing out that it is singular, then also we can understand what exactly he means. Because to Abraham and his seed was the promise made, means all his descendants came from only one seed. And that seed is Isaac. Isn't it? So Isaac was that seed and he was a single person. It is one seed only. And later on talking about the spiritual children of Abraham, then he says there is only one seed that is Christ means Jesus Christ is the spiritual seed there that was promised to Abraham. Now when God promised Abraham this great promise, he said the seed will be of two kinds. One is as the stars of heaven and other as the sand of the seashore. In that we can see the physical promise, a promise referring to the physical seed and also the promise referring to the spiritual seed. So, keeping this in mind, we come across two persons, that is singular persons. Abraham's son Isaac and then spiritual seed is Jesus. So there also we can see there were just one person there. So, brothers and sisters, this we see again and again repeated by God that it was through that particular seed only that God will bless Abraham and uh, have this covenant with his seed and with his people and all that. It was particularly one person only and that was Isaac. Now, before Isaac was born, we all know that uh, when God appeared to Abraham the second time and uh, he spoke to him about him being his shield and exceeding great reward, you know what Abraham said? We read that in chapter 15, verses 1 and 2. After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abraham in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abraham, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. For that what God Abraham re replied, and Abraham said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless, and the steward of my house is Eliezer of Damascus? And Abraham said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed, and lo, one born in my house is mine heir. So that's what Abraham said. You say, you are my exceeding great reward, but what will you give me, seeing I go childless? And this servant, Eliezer, he is going to become the heir, he is going to inherit everything. Like that Abraham spoke. And then God corrected him and said, Eliezer is not going to be that seed. Someone who is born from thine own body, means physically, right from your, from your bowels. That's what we read in verse 4. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This is not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. So it is from your body that seed will come. It is not someone whom you adopt or anything. It should be physically, literally from your body. Okay, so God says, Eliezer is not a seed, but someone comes from you. But later on, we know what happened, brothers and sisters, as they waited and... 
we were getting older and older and uh, nothing happened, uh, Sara comes up with the idea of taking a surrogate woman. Now this is uh, very common when uh, husband and wife don't have the capacity to have ch children, particularly the wife cannot conceive, she has some physical problem. What they do is they take the sperm and the egg and fertilize in a test tube and then insert that in the third woman who is called the surrogate woman who will bear children for this couple. And after nine months she will deliver the child and give it back to that parents. Uh, this they do on some agreement basis for some, some of amount of money or something. And that's it. So, but those days, that test tube baby's fertilization outside the womb was not all possible. So they used to literally take them as a concubine. So Sarah comes up with that idea. And she offers her servant, Hagar, to Abraham and tells him, through her you give me a son. And so Abraham goes in to her and she becomes pregnant and Ishmael is born. So Ishmael, they thought, was the heir. You know, they thought Ishmael is the one. But later on in chapter 17, when God makes a covenant with Abraham and asks him to be circumcised and all that, you know, God again says something which is very surprising to Abraham. Now God had said Eliezer is not the one someone through your body should come. Now in that way only Ishmael was born. It was born to Abraham only. It was Abraham's uh, blood only. But then here in 17th chapter, verse 15, God says it should be through Sarah. Read that in 1715. And God said unto Abraham, As for Sarai thy wife, thou shalt not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. So even Sarah's name was changed. You see earlier, Abraham's name was changed in verse 5. Neither shall thy name anymore be called Abram, but thy name shall be called Abraham. See the word ha was used. Ha means life give a breath. Hadam, Hawa, like that. So here it shall be not Sarah anymore. It will be Sarah uh, shall be her name. Verse 16, and I will bless her and give thee a son also of her. Yeah, I will bless her and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of people shall be born of her. So here God is very clearly saying, the seed whom I'm going to bless is not only to come out of from your body, but should come through Sarah also, through a seed which shall be born to you and Sarah. You see, now when Sarah heard this in the next chapter in verse 18, when the three uh, people come to their house, three angels, one including the Lord, you know, how Sarah's reaction, we all know. You see that in uh, verse 9, chapter 18, verse 9. And they said unto him, Where is Sarah thy wife? And he said, Behold, in the tent. And he said, I will certainly return unto thee according to the time of life. And lo, Sarah thy wife shall have a son. And Sarah heard it in the tent door, which was behind him. Verse 11. Now Abraham and Sarah were old and well stricken in age and it ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of woman. You see. And therefore Sarah laughed within herself saying after I am vexed old shall I have pleasure and my Lord be old also. So she laughed within herself. So Sarah began to laugh and then we know what happened. And the Lord said unto Abraham wherefore did Sarah laugh saying I of a shooty bear a child which am old, is anything too hard for the Lord? At the time appointed I will return unto thee according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. That is after nine months. So, and verse 15, And then Sarah denied, saying, I laughed not. You see, she lied to them. She said, I didn't laugh, for she was afraid, and she said, Nay, but thou didst laugh. So she laughed. Now how many times we have heard about this? That Abraham and believed God, he was the father of faithful and all that, but Sarah could
couldn't believe she had doubted that and she laughed but abram believed but do you know something even before sara laughed even abram had laughed you know when when god said that sara will become a mother of nations and all abram couldn't control his laugh we see here in chapter 17 verse 16 and 17 again and i will bless thee and give thee a son also of her yeah i will bless her and she shall be a mother of nations kings of people shall be of her then abram fell upon his face and laughed and said in his heart shall a child be born unto him that is 100 years old and shall sara that is 90 years old bear You see, Abraham fell upon his face and laughed. At least Sarah laughed within herself quietly, but Abraham fell on the ground and laughed like anything. You see, so Abraham also laughed, brothers and sisters, because the matter was such; it was such an impossible thing. And then you know, Abraham even comes up with a suggestion to help God out. you know god had promised him a seed now that is not going to happen so god is saying sara will bear a son and all so abram says all that is not going to happen why not take ishmael only since ishmael is from my blood let ishmael be thy seed see that's what he suggests to god and abram said unto god oh that ishmael might live before the there you see was 19 and god said sara thy wife shall bear thee a son indeed and thou shall call his name isaac and i will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant and with his seed after him so god very clearly said it's not going to be ishmael sara only is going to bear a child and you have to name him isaac even the name god said its name should be isaac and with him only i'm going to make my covenant You see, with him will I establish my covenant with him, and after words with his seed. So particularly, God said it is to be through Isaac, not through Eliezer, not through Ishmael, but Isaac. So Isaac was a particular seed. It was one seed. It was Isaac. So through him only I will establish my covenant, and like that. So. there you see it was talking about seed means particularly one seed that is isaac but of course god said i will bless ishmael also uh, in verse uh, 20 and as for ishmael i have heard thee behold i have blessed him and will make him fruitful and multiply him exceedingly to all princes shall he beget and i will make him a great nation so god said i'll make him a great nation but nevertheless it will be through isaac only i will establish my covenant so it was one seed only it was isaac so that's what we understand what paul meant not unto seeds as of many you know abraham had children even after he had isaac ishmael he had first and then isaac and then after many years after isaac got married and probably sara was dead by that time abram took a third wife also that we see in genesis 25:1 many christians are not aware of this they know only about sara and hagar but here in 25:1 we read then again abram took a wife and her name was ketura so her name was ketura and she bare him zimran jokshan medan midian ishbak and shua six sons she begat for abraham so abraham had totally eight sons you see so god blessed them all their names are given and they all became various nations so as god had said to abraham earlier in 17:6 he had said i will make thee exceedingly fruitful and i will make nations of thee and kings shall come out of thee so many nations have come we do not know where can't even count but nevertheless his covenant of promise through be will be through one particular seed only and that is isaac so that's what paul he says not unto seeds as of money but as of one that is 
Christ, he says. So Jesus. But then that is, again, we have to understand that we have a physical seed that is literally the son of Abraham, that is Isaac, and then Jacob, and then the 12 sons of Jacob who became the 12 tribes of Israel. So they were all the seed of Abraham from the fleshly standpoint. But then later on, afterwards, Jesus also is born of the same line to Abraham and he is the actual spiritual seed as we all know it. So brothers and sisters, these two things is what God was doing in the second world. The world God left them on their own to live as they like and be deceived by the devil and to do all sinful things and all and to learn from their actions what will be the effect of sin and suffer the penalty of death and all that. God let the world go on its own. But God is meanwhile working out a plan through which he is going to ultimately bless the whole world. Isn't that what God said to Abraham? That he will bless his seed. And then through the seed, he will bless all the nations of the world. So God had a plan to bless everyone. But right now, he permitted them to continue in sin, to be deceived by the devil and to suffer the consequence. But all along, God had a plan to bless them. And how is he going to do that? Through the seed of Abraham. And his seed, the seed of Abraham, will be in two classes. That is what we see as the stars and as the sand of the seashore. So there's going to be a physical seed, there's going to be a spiritual seed also. And that is what God has been developing all through in this second world, you see. The, the second world is divided into two ages. In these two ages, God is developing two class of people who will be used by God to bless all the world, all the families and nations of the world in the coming world, in the third world. So we talk about the third world later on. But right now what God was doing, right since the time that the world began to be repopulated, God is preparing a class of people. And that is what we see here in the two ages mentioned here, the Jewish age and the gospel age. That is, before Christ or up unto Christ from after the flood, there was a group God was selecting. And after Christ, until his second coming and the end of the second world, a class of people God was developing. And they are here referred to as the seed of Abraham through which God will bless all the families of the world. So in that we see there's a physical seed and there's a spiritual seed. Well, this is beautifully shown to us by the same Apostle Paul in the same book of Galatians. When he compares Isaac with Ishmael, and he compares them to the two classes that God is developing, the physical and the spiritual. You see, that's another picture. You see, it's a beautiful picture. Though. We see that very clearly in Galatians chapter 4, verses 22 to 28. We see that slowly here, chapter 4, verses 22 onwards, Galatians. For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a born maid and other by free woman. So he's see, talking about two sons here. And these two sons, one was born of a bond woman that refers to Hagar. And then the free woman that is Sarah. You know, Hagar was a born slave in the house of Abraham, whom Sarah asked Abraham to take instead of her to give her a child. And that's how Ishmael was born, we all know that. Verse 23, And he who was of the bond woman was born after the flesh, but he of the free woman 
was by the promise. Now, he was born after of the bondwoman means Ishmael was born in his physical way, in a natural way. Just like all the children are born, that's how they were born. It was a physical thing. God was not involved in it. It was not required for God to get involved. It was born just because Abram was capable of having its child and Hagar was still young and she conceived and had Ishmael. But the one born of the free woman was not like that. It was a promise. Because by that time Abraham was even older, he was 100 years old, and Sarah was 90, and it was an impossible thing. Because Sarah had passed that age when women can have a child. You see, woman produces the egg that is required to bear a child until up to a certain age, like now about in the 50s. After that it stops and then that means she literally can't have children anymore after that. It had been many years since that had stopped and therefore that's what made Sarah to laugh and Abram to laugh. How can she have a son? But nevertheless a son was born that is purely because of God's promise. Then it's not a physical thing, but it's a spiritual thing. It's because of the promise Isaac was born. That's what here is told to us. And verse 24. Which things are an allegory? For these are the two covenants. The one from Mount Sinai, which generates to bondage, which is Hagar. And this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and answers to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage with the children. Now, Paul is saying here, these things are an allegory, he says. Allegory means uh, an illustration, a parable or a symbolic matter. So, Abraham's wives and the sons born to these two women are picture of something greater and more deeper. Now, that is what we said all that happened in the past is, you see, they are like types, you know. Types mean shadows of something greater to come. You see, so this is like a type, he says. Now, Abraham had these two women. In the same way, God had made covenant, two covenants. You see, that's what he says. First of all, he compares Hagar, his Abraham's marriage to Hagar, with God's covenant, with the one that was made in Mount Sinai. Now, what is this covenant? And that was made with the physical children are descendants of Abraham. Now Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the twelve sons, they all became 70 and they came and settled down in Egypt and there after 215 years they became a nation there and they grew in numbers. We all know that story and they became bond slaves and later God delivered them through Moses and brought them to Mount Sinai and there he made a covenant with them by giving them the law and he said you shall be my people as long as you keep the law. So they were bonded to the law. You see, through the law, God made a covenant with them. So that, he says, Paul says, this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and answers to Jerusalem, which now is, means at the time of writing this epistle, Jerusalem was still there and the people of Israel, the Jews, the people of fleshly children of Abraham were still there. You see, so it refers to them, he says, who are still in bondage with her children means. They are all bound to the law, you see, because through the law only they were born. You know, they made a covenant with God through the law. So they are under the law. Just as Hagar was a born servant, she was not a free woman. She was bound to that family because she was a slave. Like that, the Jerusalem, which now is the people that were thriving at the time of the writing of this epistle, early church, they were still there. It's a nation of Israel, were still there. Jerusalem, temple, everything was there. So, they are all compared to Ishmael. You see, the one who was born as a result of this bond woman. So, Abraham's marriage with this bond woman. Woman. So, they are all under the law covenant and they are like Ishmael is. So, the fleshly sons 
that are born through Isaac, Isaac, Jacob, and, and the 12 tribes, they are now compared to Ishmael because they are born to the law. They are like born to the bonds women, Hagar. You see, and then verse 26 he says, But Jerusalem which is above is free, which is the mother of us all. Now us means the believers, the followers of Jesus Christ, Paul and the Galatian church and all these people. Now they are born to the free woman, but from Jerusalem which is from above. You see, means Jesus Christ came from above. You see, and we through Christ have become children of God. Now, that is referring to Sarah. Sarah now symbolizes the covenant of promise. You see, Isaac was born because God promised to Abraham. And that's it. There's no condition. You know, unlike to Israel, God gave one law and then they were bound to that law. They were bound to keep that law and all. But the promise is just God's unconditional promise. And as the result of which, we are born, he says, and now we are compared to Isaac. See, that's what we say. You see, there the two Jerusalem. You see, for Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, which answered to Jerusalem, which now is the literal Jerusalem, the people, the physical children, descendants of Abraham, which was present at that time. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, means something spiritual. And that is what very clearly we see in the promise God made to Abraham. He said, I will make thy seed as stars of the sky and as the sand of the seashore. There you see, one from above, one from below. See, the sand of the sea refers to the physical descendants of Abraham, the physical seed, whereas the stars of heaven refers to the spiritual children of Abraham, that is to come through Christ. You see, both cases, the seed is one, Isaac or Jesus. But one is physical, literally born from Abraham's own body. Another is a spiritual son. You see, one born because of God's promise. Because God had promised right from the beginning that the seed of woman will bless all the nations and that seed is to be born through Abraham now. It has to be through woman. And later on it was said through Abraham and then through David and finally through Mary. It was born. You see, it was born because... God had promised. So that is from heaven and that seed is from heaven. Jesus came from heaven. That is what we read. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15 we see the first Adam was from the earth, Arthi. He was made a living soul. But the second Adam, the, the last man, he is from above. It is from heaven. He came from heaven. So the, he represents the heavenly class, the stars of the sky. Whereas Isaac represents the earthly class, that is, the physical descendants of Abraham. So there you see when God said to Abraham, in thy seed I will bless all the nations of the world, there is to be two classes of people, the two types of seed, one through physical descendants, another through spiritual sons of Abraham. So that is what he says here, and in verse 26, he says, we'll read again, but Jerusalem which is above is free, which is the mother of us all. Verse 27, for it is written, rejoice thou barren that thou bearest not forth, and cry thou that travelest not, for the desolate hath many more children than she which hath an husband. And verse 28, now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. Now we are the children of promise. Now we, we brethren, he says. Brethren means the Christians, the Christian believers. Now they are, he says, we are the children of the promise. Means in real terms, the real Isaac, we are the literal seed of Isaac, that is Abraham. But, but they were born later, you see. Just as in the life of Abraham, first Ishmael was born. Though the promise was made first by God to Sarah and Abraham, but they didn't have children 
for almost 25 years. And that's when Hagar came in, and through Hagar, Ishmael was born first. Ishmael was the heir in the house. You know the story as we read in the book of Genesis. Now when Hagar became pregnant, now it was clearly understood that the problem was with Sarah, not with Abraham, because Abraham was able to give her a child. But Sarah was not in a position to bear a child. So Hagar, at one point, she became even proudful also and began to be puffed up. And there was this bitter moments with uh, Sarah and all, so much so that Sarah had to mistreat her also. And all this happened. And then also God advised Hagar to be submissive to her owner, that is Sarah. And we know that later on, Ishmael was born. And Ishmael was the heir. Now, he was considered as the heir of Abraham. And that went on for a period of time. And when Ishmael had become a lad, then Sahara became pregnant and Isaac was born. There you see. So first Ishmael was born and afterwards Isaac was born. So first, for some time, Ishmael was the only heir in the house. And it looked as if that he would inherit everything. But then later on, Isaac was born. But after Isaac was born, there was trouble in the family. Ishmael was mistreating Isaac, and in fact, literally mocking him and all that. And there was jealousy and bitterness and all that, and this came up to Abraham and Sarah, and Sarah declared that this is not going to continue like this. And she said, send away the bondwoman and her son. He cannot be here with my son. And Sarah said, and Abraham was very, very grieved with this matter because he loved Ishmael as his own son. In fact, he was his son. You know, then what God says, you know, he says, do as your wife says, send them off. That's what God said. And literally Abraham with a very heavy heart, he gives them some bread and water and he sends them off. And we know what happened afterwards. They were wandering in the wilderness, wandering, wandering, until they ran out of water and bread. They were on the brink of dying. That is when God sends an angel, saves them. And later on, they go on to be a big nation. And Ishmael had 12 sons and later on, and they became a nation. And of whom Arabs have come. Now the, the present day Arab people all came from that bond woman's uh, son Ishmael. So God also had it that way. But then who was there? Isaac only was there. So until Isaac came, Ishmael was the center of everything. But once Isaac was born, Ishmael was sent away. And it was Isaac's time. And Isaac was the most favored one. So these two things beautifully we see in the two ages here we see in the second world. The first preference was to Ishmael, the fleshly seed of Abraham. That is, the 12 tribes and later on they became a nation and God made a covenant. The law covenant, law was given. And from that time, they were the most blessed people of all the people in the world. You see, that's how it was up until the time Jesus Christ was born. So for nearly 1800 and plus years, God specially favored the fleshly children of Israel. You see, how much so that Paul in one place says, you know, how blessed they were in Romans chapter 9, verses 1 to 16, we can read. Chapter 9, 1 to 16. I say the truth in Christ, I lie not, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost, that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart, for I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. So he's talking about his brethren. His kinsmen means his family, according to the flesh, he says, because he was a Jew. He was from the tribe of Benjamin and he was a, physically a Jew. And he's having this heaviness towards his brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. Just as we say, oh, this is my sister according to flesh. You know, means 
worldly sister, bodily, you know, fleshly way, sister. And then we have others who are spiritual sisters also. I myself have two sisters from my you know, fleshly way. But spiritually there are more sisters. Like that Paul says here, and of them he says in verse 4, Who are Israelites to whom pertain the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises? You see, they are the ones who had all this. They were adopted as, by God as a special people. To them belong the glory. You see, God's glory was with them. And the covenants and the law was given to them. God gave all these wonderful principles of life to them. And the service of God and the promises. Verse 5. Whose are the fathers and of whom, as concerning the flesh, even Christ came. You see. So, all the fathers were of them only. Abraham was their father. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob were all the, their father. And even Christ, according to the flesh, has come from them only. Jesus Christ was born to, to Jewish people. Joseph and Mary. So, in every way, they had this special blessing. You see, they were so blessed in that way. But that was all only up to the time Jesus Christ was born. You see, until then they had their time. They had the law, the prophets always sent to them. God protected them, guided them in every way and all that. So that was the period in which God was dealing with the physical descendants of Abraham. And through them he was selecting the faithful ones. You see, he was preparing and selecting a class of people who are called the true Israelites. Now, they are not all Israel who are in Israel because many are there in Israel. Those days, all this period, they were there, but they did not have the faith of Abraham. They did not have any love towards God. So leaving them apart, Amidst them, there was a remnant always, a few who were always faithful, whom we call the real Israel. So that's what we see here in verse 6. Not as though the word of God has taken none effect, for they are not all Israel which are of Israel. They are not all Israel which are of Israel. They may be physically living in the land of Israel. They may be physically the descendants of Abraham, but they are not true Israel. But there were some who were true Israelites, like the one Jesus mentions in John 1, 47. You know, when Nathaniel came, Jesus said these words about him. John 1, 47. Jesus saw Nathaniel coming to him and saith of him, Behold an Israelite indeed, in whom is no guile, means no dishonesty. Mean, he said, Behold an Israelite indeed. So, they are not all Israel who are in Israel, but some are Israel indeed. So such people God was preparing and, and he was selecting down in this nearly 2,000 years before Christ. You see, so once that was finished, then God sent his son. The right time Jesus Christ was born. And he was the one who kept the law and he made us free from the law. So much so that from that time on, just like as in the story we saw, once Isaac was born, for some time there was this hatred from Ishmael and Ishmael was mocking and persecuting Isaac there. And after some time, Ishmael was totally sent off only. Isaac was growing in the house. Like that, Paul says in here also in Galatians, uh, it happened. Let's see verse uh, 28 now after saying, We brethren as Isaac was are the children of promise. In verse 29 he says, But as then he that was born of the flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit, even so it is now. He says, Just as Ishmael was born according to flesh persecuted he that was born of the spirit. It is the happening in the same way now also. As it happened, the physical 
children of Abraham were persecuting the spiritual children of Abraham. They were born through Christ, you see. They were persecuted. How they were persecuted? You see, the Christ himself was persecuted so much. He was hated and he was manhandled and he was spit upon and finally they even crucified him. That was the extent to which Ishmael hated Isaac. And afterwards, Christ's followers were also persecuted by the fleshly Israel. Right? In Jerusalem, many were killed and persecuted. And where all they spread, there all the Jews tried to persecute them. But up unto a certain stage after which God cast them out of Israel. God sent the Romans who destroyed Jerusalem and all the cities and they were taken slaves and they went away. Like Ishmael and Hagar were sent away until they began to wander in the wilderness for nearly 2,000 years. The Jewish people were cast out. You see here as we read in verse 30, Nevertheless, what said the scripture? Cast out the bondwoman with her son, and the son of bondwoman shall not be here with the son of the free woman. You see, that's what happened. God cast them out of favor because they cannot continue in God's favor after the spiritual seed is born, which in 31 we see, So then, brethren, we are not the children of bondwoman, but of the free. So once Isaac was born, Ishmael was cut off. So they began to wander in the diaspora, scattering in all among the Gentiles and being persecuted and this, suffered so much. Meanwhile, God's all blessings and grace was given to the spiritual seed. That is, those who were born through Christ. Now we go back to that uh, statement Paul made in chapter 3. He said very clearly, brethren, uh, verse 16, Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not unto seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed which is Christ. He said Christ is the seed. Now Christ is the seed means, Christ means it is Jesus and his body also. Now Christ has got his body also. Jesus is the head and the body is the church. You see, that is together the Christ, the one seed. Just as we said in Isaac, though he was one person, singular one person, not Eliezer, not Ishmael, but one Isaac. But through Isaac only all the nations of Israel, all the people of Israel came out. Like that, through one person, that is Jesus, his body was developed. Through him, a new creature was born. You see, a new Children of God. How? By faith in Him. See, that's what we read in verse 26, 326 Galatians. For you are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. How clearly it says, you believers, because of your faith in Jesus, you become children of God, he says. See? For you are all children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. And verse 27. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. So all those who believed in him and are baptized in his name have put on Christ. Means you have come into the body of Christ. Now you become part of Christ. Members in particular. You see that is what baptism is. Through baptism we become the members of his body. So how beautiful this is. And for this we don't need to be descendants, physical descendants of Abraham. We don't need to be born to Abraham or Isaac or Jacob and the 12 tribes. It's totally not required. One thing that is required to be the children of God through Christ is to believe in him and to be baptized in the name of Christ. That's enough. No, it's not required whether we be from which tribe or which family or whether we are from Isaac or not, it doesn't matter. All it matters is that we have faith in Jesus. And that's what we read here. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. 
now it doesn't matter whether we are jew or gentile it doesn't matter whether we are bond or free whether we are male or female it doesn't matter we are all one in christ jesus and if you be in christ then you are abraham's seed and heir according to the promise there you see we become seed of abraham we become the promised seed by being in christ you see and if you be christ then you are abraham's seed see that's the spiritual seed is talking about that is the heavenly class you see who receive his heavenly call as the stars of the sky he said you see that is the class he mentioned if you be christ then you are abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise so we are like isaac now now the physical descendants they too are blessed god has a plan for them also and in the age before christ god has selected all the faithful worthy ones the true israelites god has set apart them for to be a blessing the blessing is going to come through the physical as well as the spiritual seed but more particularly through the spiritual seed which he is developing after christ through christ and after christ in this 2000 years that is what god is doing the gospel went out and all those who believed are being called and here also likewise we have the same condition not all who are believing christ are really christians just as not all who are in israel are israelites you see not all are israel who are in israel like that way not all who are in christianity are christians <laughs> but some are israelite indeed like nathaniel who really are israelites like that there are some who are christians indeed truly christians they are faithful christians they are the ones whom god is setting apart and preparing in these 2000 years since christ jesus came so two class of people are being prepared there you see first literal seed and talking about literal seed god gave them a sign by which they can become different from all other people that is the sign of circumcision you see even before isaac was born abram and all his household were circumcised isaac was circumcised and every jew that is born was circumcised and that same thing even the mohammedans also are continuing the arabs are continuing to this day because they are also the seed of abraham do not the primary seed that is isaac because ishmael also was from abraham so ishmael was circumcised and that practice has continued with them but mainly the fleshly jews circumcision and all but when you come to the spiritual seed after christ very clearly paul declares we are not required to have this fleshly circumcision at all now it doesn't matter whether we are circumcised or not what matters is that we have faith in christ and everything is spiritual and then we are spiritually circumcised and we become a new creature and that's what he says in galatians uh, chapter 6 uh, verse 15 for in christ jesus neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision but a new creature so we become a new creature whether we are jew or gentile whether we are circumcised or not circumcised it doesn't matter at all what matters is that we become new creatures how we become new by being baptized into christ by dying to self and we are raised into a new life by the receiving of the holy spirit through the spirit of god now we become god's children you see and that is what is called the new creature verse 16 for as many as walk according to this rule peace on them and mercy and upon the israel of god there you see now the church has become the israel of god just as the israel was there before in the flesh god how he chose them and blessed them in a very special way now the same thing is doing to the believers the new creation or called the israel of god now they are the israel of god for this 2000 years the christians were considered as god's israel and god began to bless them and through them chose the class of people 
So brothers and sisters, this is what God has been doing in these two ages in the second world. And one thing we need to be clear about this is when we say stars of heaven and sand of sea, sure we now understand who are the stars and who are referred to the sand of the seashore. And the stars are definitely greater in glory. They are from heavenly class. So likewise, brothers and sisters, all those who lived until Christ gave his life on the cross, they come in one class. And all those who come after Christ shed his blood on the cross, they come as another class. You know, these two classes are very, very different and and one is like stars and others like the sand of the seashore in terms of greatness also simply because those who lived before Christ were called to an earthly blessing whereas those who were called after Christ were called to a heavenly blessing there you see God brought him out to the plain and said to Abraham you look to east and west to north and south all this land I'll give to you and your seed and that's what he said. But God didn't say, look up to heaven. God said, all this land. And f literally the physical, that land, everything, God gave it to them and they lost it. Again, God will give it back to them in his second return. Now, now already uh, things are happening that they have come back and they're now settled for almost 70 years now. So that land, God will give it to them. But to those who came after Christ, we are told not to look upon that which is on the earth. Put not your affection on things of the earth, but look up, he said. Means heavenly blessing. Here we are not promised earthly blessing, but we are always called to seek that which is above, even Christ sitting on the right hand of God. So ours is a heavenly call. So what is greater? Definitely those who came after Christ have been called for a greater blessing. So when God's kingdom comes, there will be this heavenly seed and earthly seed. The fleshly seed through whom blessings will come. But there will be the spiritual seed also, that is the heavenly class, that is through Christ. So how beautifully we see this. And um, there is one chapter in the book of Hebrews which talks about all the great worthy people right from Abel. Now Adam is not considered because he didn't do anything significant to be included there. But right from Abel, the first son of Adam, then Enoch, and then Noah, of course uh, during the flood, and after Noah, Abraham, and Isaac, and Jacob, and Joseph, and there on so many names uh, are mentioned. That is. Uh, what we all know about in the book of Hebrews chapter 11, isn't it? We are all very, very familiar about all these people. Sarah is included there. And um, talking about uh, Moses, we see how Moses, how much he sacrificed through faith because of their faithfulness to God, how much they were able to give up for God. He left the pleasures of Egypt, to suffer with, with God's children and all that we know. And then, of course, when the walls of Jericho fell down, we have mentioned is Rahab, and then so many more. He, he says, time is not enough for me to mention all of them, but just he mentions a few by their names and some by some of the main characteristics there. Verse 32, and what shall I say more, for the time would fail me to... Tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and of Jephthah and David. You see, these are all the great men of God who loved God, were faithful to God. And Samuel and of the prophets. There were so many prophets. Isaiah and Jeremiah and Daniel and so many. Who through faith subdued kingdoms wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lion. Now we know who that refers to. Quenched the violence of fire, like Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed violent in fight, turned to 
flight the armies of the aliens. They fought with so much zeal for God's glory, isn't it? And women received their dead, raised to life again, and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection. They could have been delivered if only they had given up their faith or they had given up fighting for God, but they were not willing to give up their faith. They were so willing to even endure torture and death also because they had hope in a resurrection, better resurrection we read. And then verse 36 and others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yeah, moral of bonds and imprisonment, all this they did because of their faithfulness to God. Verse 27, they were stoned and they were sawn asunder. Can you imagine that? We understand that Isaiah was the one who was sawn asunder. You know, how much hard it is for us to even imagine all that. They were tempted, were slain with the sword, they were wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented. God's people, righteous people have always been tormented. Why? Because this is Satan's world. And in Satan's world, good people are hated. The people of God are always tormented. And that's what happened we see in the Old Testament. Verse 38, Of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts, in mountains, and in dens and caves of the earth. We know about prophet Elijah. How he was clothed, how he was wandering everywhere, living in caves and all. How much hardships and all they endured. And verse 39, here we see, These all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. So they did not receive the promise, the fulfillment of God's promise. But they obtained a good report. Through their faith and their actions and their sacrifice, they received a good report from God. You know, in the sight of God, they were precious. God has entered their names in his list of faithful ones. But they did not receive the promise. You know why? Here you see verse 40. God having provided some better thing for us. Us means the believers now in Christ Jesus. That they without us should not be made perfect. That they means those who lived before Christ died for mankind. So all of them, the faithful ones, obtained a good report. But they did not receive the promise because... God having provided some better thing for us. For us means those who came in Christ, you know, through Christ. Some better thing is this, something better, higher. That is what I said, heavenly. That they without us should not be made perfect. That they cannot receive God's blessings before us or apart from us. That's how God had it. Brothers and sisters, many Christians think that Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, David, Moses are all in heaven. No way. No one was perfected. Because the first resurrection has to take place only after Jesus returns. And then those that are Christ should raise first and then only others should be raised. No one has gone to heaven till now. You see, it is only... After the church is blessed, that they can be blessed. So very clearly we read this here. God having provided something better for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. So they're all in waiting. You see, until God brings out this class of people, the faithful ones, during these 2,000 years, that is what God has been doing. The gospel went everywhere and all those who believed, of those who believed, the faithful ones are being set apart and prepared and made ready for to be resurrected first. So, brothers and sisters, this very beautifully Christ has said to us in just one verse, comparing the two classes and who is greater, which is the greater class. Very beautifully, lastly, we'll read Matthew chapter 11, verse 11, and conclude this study. Matthew 11, 11. Verily I say unto you, Jesus is saying, among them that are born of women, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist. Now you see, according to Jesus, of all that are born of women, right from the beginning, we saw the list from Abel to Enoch and Noah and Abraham and the prophets and David and all these righteous people. Christ says, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist. So John the Baptist is the greatest. 
said. Why? John, from the time of his birth, how he grew up, how holy life he lived, how he was set apart from the world. He was in the wilderness. He was wearing camel's clothing. Now, how difficult it is. He had a rough life. And he was always in prayer and he was eating locusts and wild honey. So, in that kind of a hardship, he began to prepare himself and he sacrificed everything. And finally, he lost his life also. And at a very young age, at the age of 30, he was killed also. So, when we see all this, what a great sacrifice. There were so many who were before him also who were martyrs. But of whom Jesus says he is the greatest. And then you know what he says. That's very, very interesting. I'll read again. Verily I say unto you, among them that are born of women, there has not risen a greater than John the Baptist. Notwithstanding, he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Now Jesus is saying, he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than the greatest of all those who lived before Christ. You see, because they are under a different dispensation. They are under the law. You see, because John was the last. Though Jesus, John lived during the same time as Jesus, he died before Jesus could give his ransom sacrifice on the cross. So he's not coming under the heavenly class. You see, the spiritual class. He died before Jesus died. And he is the last of all the prophets. The law and prophets were up to John, we read. So he was the ending. So after that, Jesus died and then the church was born. Now the church, in the church, Jesus is the least, is greater than John the Baptist. Why? Is it because we are more holy or greater than all those who lived before that time? No way. We know ourselves, we are nowhere in comparison. What faith they had, the faith of David when he faced Goliath, and their zeal for the glory of God, how much they suffered for the sake of God, and all that we know. Before them we are nothing. But it's simply because we are in a different dispensation. Through Christ, we have been called for a greater blessing. Through Christ, we become that heavenly seed, the spiritual seed. And just because of that, brothers and sisters, even the least of us is greater. And because we are called to a higher hope, to a heavenly hope. And from this we can understand basically what God was doing in this second world. He was preparing two classes of people through the seed of Abraham, which is one, the fleshly seed and the spiritual seed. So, brothers and sisters, now we are almost at the end of the gospel age. And at the end of the world, this age also will end. And then there will be a new heaven and new earth. And in that new heaven and new earth, these two faithful classes of people whom God has selected in these two ages, God will bring blessing to all mankind. So that, God willing, we will take up in our next class. Now we will take a break for this two weeks as we are in the Christmas season. And after this, God willing, we'll resume our study that is class 34 in the new year 2023. Until then, I request you to kindly go through our videos. And if you have missed any of the classes, please go through it. And if you have any questions or doubts regarding what we have already covered, do WhatsApp to us or email to us. Uh, through text message or voice message and we will try to help you out. So until then, God be with you and bless you.